I'll start sharing my Mr. screen. Russell, you have me? Um, hold on one second. All right, I, I, I lost all the names. What's your last name? Tate. Oh, yes, Miss Tate, I'm Archie here. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm going to call the names again. All right, so before I start going through, uh, the physiology that we're going to be learning is going to come from my chapter here. Um, and then I'm going to pull up the engage chapter to show you one little spot that I want you to look at. And that's about it out of that chapter. But the rest of the, the text information is going to come from this chapter. Um, now, you guys just finished your second testing block. So uh, I have all those practicals graded. You should see your increased grade in the grade book already. If you, if you see a, a issue with it or uh, typically I don't miss grading one because I just go down in order. That's why I always wait until everybody's done. But if someone did take it late and you don't see that you're, if I don't write in there that says I've graded your practical, that means you need to email me. I, I, I looked over, I missed it. So just always check that. That's why I always wait until everybody's done so I, I won't miss any, but sometimes somebody takes it late. At any rate, um, before I start, our last testing block, because in AMP2, we, we have three major testing blocks. AMP1, you had four, if you remember that. Our last testing block is going to cover the lymphatic system, which is exercise seven in the engage manual. And it's going to cover the reproductive system which we're going to cover next week, the urinary system the following week, and the very last uh, exercise in the, in the engage manual, exercise 10 is acid base balance in the body. And we're going to cover the four basic primary acid base imbalances. <clears throat> and I'm going to teach you how you can determine what type of imbalance we have. So on the third testing block, we have lymphatics, reproduction, uh, urinary, and acid base balance. That's what's going to be on your last testing block. So over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to finish this course. It's amazing that it's already at the end, right? So anyway, um, do you guys have any questions before I start talking? Mr. Russell? Go ahead. Will we review what we got wrong on the test so we can be prepared for the final or no? I can't open the, the, the practicals in the test for review um, because you then, some students take it late. There is a department policy about not reviewing the actual test. But what I do do is if you want, I set up a, a Zoom meeting, I pull your test up and then I go through it with you in the Zoom meeting, but I don't share the questions and I, I let you know which questions you got wrong. Okay. So if, if we need something like that, you just have to send me an email so I can set that up. Okay. Um, and the, the final practical doesn't pull questions from the other three practicals anyway, but it does cover all the same stuff. I mean, once you learn how to identify the tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart, it doesn't matter what test it was on. You can only put a pointer on that one valve. You know what I mean? Okay. So the final practical only covers everything that we've already covered. And it's all the same pictures. It's all the same models. So what you're really reviewing is you're just going back through the Quizlets and just, oh yeah, I remember that's the brachiocephalic, the left brachiocephalic vein. Oh yeah, that's the head of the pancreas. Oh, that's the accessory pancreatic duct. You're basically just going to review all of those models for the practical. Okay. Does that make sense? And the physiology too, correct? And the physiology, correct. And nothing new is going to be on it. It's just going to be, you know, questions on the same stuff that we already had. Now, the questions won't be the identical question, but there's only so many ways that I can ask you how to calculate the inspiratory capacity. You know what I mean? 
that was on this this last thing. So again, it's all the same stuff. You just need to review your notes and your material and you'll be fine. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so let's get into uh, the lymphatic system and look at what the lymphatic system is composed of and the three basic functions of the lymphatic system. So again, you're gonna be reviewing this chapter. It's the first link in our exercise seven module under learning resources or whatever that is called right there. Um, so it's the chapter from the models book. So the lymphatic system really is composed of special vessels called lymphatic vessels. So you're going to learn the names of a few of them as you go later today or maybe tomorrow, the next day. When you pull a Quizlet up, you'll see the, the lymphatic man model. It's just a plaque and it'll point to say lymph nodes in your armpit for axillary lymph nodes. It'll point to uh, the right lymphatic duct, the left lymphatic duct, different ducts on there, right? So we have these special vessels. Inside the, those lymphatic vessels, oh, and the vessels run along wherever you have arteries and veins, by the way. So where typically where we have vascular tissue, that is tissues that are supplied by the uh, arteries and veins, you also have lymphatics in those tissues, lymphatic vessels. Inside the lymphatic vessel is a fluid called lymph. Now lymph is somewhat of a creamy color. There's water in there. There it excess water off of your tissues go into the lymphatic system, into the lymphatic vessels. If the lymphatic vessels are clogged up or is something wrong with lymph flow, then you might uh, get a lot of edema, swelling because of tissue fluid buildup. So the fluid goes from the tissue into the lymphatic vessel. And the reason why is, which is there's water and leaked out proteins from the blood vessels go into the lymphatic vessel. But the reason why it's creamy colored is because <clears throat> in your digestive system, when we absorb fats from our diet, the fats first go into the lymphatic system. They don't get absorbed directly into the blood. So lymph is kind of loaded down with fats from your digestive system. Um, so we have vessels. We have a fluid called lymph. We also have specialized organs, lymphatic organs, like one I just mentioned, lymph nodes. You heard of lymph nodes. You have your tonsils. You learn some tonsils on one of their models, right? Uh, the thymus gland, the spleen. So we're going to look at some of these things in this chapter. We also have special white blood cells that are considered to be our immune system cells that bring about immunity, all in the lymphatic system. And we learned those cells already as well. Not all the detail on them, but you know the name, lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, the T cells and the B cells, are the cells of immunity and are part of the lymphatic system as well. We call them blood cells, but they function in immunity, right? Now, the three main functions of the lymphatic system is draining that excess fluid off of our tissues, that excess interstitial fluid, and any proteins that leaked out from the blood into the tissue. So when that fluid goes into the lymphatic vessel, that's called fluid recovery. So like I said, if somebody has a blocked up lymphatic vessel uh, near one of the appendages, an arm or a leg, the arm and leg might swell up and it can swell up a lot. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of elephantiasis, but uh, elephantiasis is caused by a blockage of a lymphatic vessel in one form of it. It's blocked by a parasitic worm. Um, and they can't collect all that draining out fluid into, into the lymphatics there. And so the fluid stays in the tissue and the arm can get really, 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 really big. The leg can get really, really, really big. Later on for kicks and giggles, if you want, you can Google elephantiasis and look at the pictures. And it looks like the person's arm or leg is, is really fat, but that's not fat, it's tissue fluid, it's severe edema. So this is a pretty important function of the lymphatic system is, tissue, is fluid recovery from a tissue. Um, obviously to carry out immune responses because of the immune cells that we're gonna learn in a minute. So we carry out immune responses to get rid of pathogens out of our body. And then we absorb our fats from our gut, our intestine directly into lymphatics. So those lymphatic vessels all around the body 
are carrying lymph ultimately towards two major ducts. We have a right duct and a left duct. The left lymphatic duct is also called the thoracic duct. You'll see that on the picture when you do the model later. <clears throat> and these two ducts actually physically join to the veins where your jugular and your subclavian veins meet up in your neck and chest area. So ultimately, all of this drained out fluid that we are collecting from the body flows in these lymphatic vessels, winds up in the right and left lymphatic duct, and then it drains into the veins. So ultimately, lymph becomes part of plasma again once it's draining into those veins. So remember where the jugular vein in your neck and the subclavian from your shoulder join together from that point down for that little stretch is called the brachiocephalic vein. So right at that little Y point that we learned about earlier on when we did the vessels, that's where these lymphatic ducts physically join to our blood vessels, right? Now, in those flowing in lymph and in several different lymphatic organs, which we're about to define, we have the lymphocytes. You also have macrophages uh, that aid in, they don't bring about the immunity, but they are part of the, some of the processes involved in it. So you're gonna learn a little bit more detail about those processes in lecture. And here, I'm just gonna tell you what the cells are doing, all right? So let's define our lymphatic tissues and organs. We have something called diffuse lymphatic tissue and diffuse lymphatic tissue, one of the major ones is called mucus associated lymphatic tissue or malt. And so what that really is, is the lamina propria, the areolar connective tissue that lies just beneath the epithelial lining of mucous membranes. You guys remember the mucous membranes like the membrane that, that lines your trachea. Remember ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium? You learned that in a &P one Yes. So below that, we have this connective tissue in there, an areolar connective tissue down in there. And we have all of our lymphocytes and other white blood cells spread out through there. And since it's not bound up in a connective tissue capsule, that is, it's not tightly bound together, it runs throughout the underlining of that mucous membrane. That's why we call it diffuse. And so the diffuse one that we're learning is malt. So that's the, the little bit of areolar connective tissue that's below the, the epithelial membranes in the body, like the, in the small intestine with simple non-ciliated columnar epithelium, if you remember that. So ly lying right below there is, is the lamina propria. It's all areolar tissue in there. That's where you have all these scattered lymphocytes. And we would call that diffuse lymphatic tissue, specifically mucus associated because it's under a mucous membrane. Okay. Now, there are names for a couple of these places where we have diffuse lymphatic tissue. And that's where we have concentrated collections of lymphocytes in those macrophages. And they actually form what we call follicles or nodules. That's another name you might read in your book, a lymphatic nodule. So where we have collections of these lymphatic follicles or nodules, which are collections of lymphocytes and macrophages, depending on where it's at, we give them different names. For instance, the follicles are found in your tonsils. Tonsils are actually partially encapsulated so they're not totally surrounded by a connective tissue capsule. I'll talk about them in a minute. But in your tonsils, we have these follicles. In an encapsulated organ, the lymph nodes are totally encapsulated. You have follicles. In diffuse layers of lymphatic tissue down the length of your small intestine, in specific areas, we have a whole bunch of collections of these follicles and we call them Peyer's patches. And then your appendix. Everybody's heard of that. And they're like, oh, our appendix doesn't do anything. Uh, well, and people get their appendix removed and all that. But we now know 
that the appendix is loaded down with follicles or lymphatic nodules. So it is a fairly important aspect of bringing about immunity in our body. Now you can live without it because we have follicles in all these other places to help us carry out immune responses and become and, 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 and develop immune system cells that can fight off the infection. So we gain immunity to whatever pathogen that we were infected with before. So in some cases we gain immunity and some we don't. It just depends on the pathogen and the type of disease that we're dealing with. So some of the tissues are gonna be encapsulated and some of the tissues are not, all right? We further classify the lymphatic tissues and organs as either being what we call primary or secondary lymphatic organs. So I want you to know which ones are primary and which ones are secondary. And this is gonna be fairly simple. There's only two primary lymphatic organs. So all of the other ones you should get by default. They would have to be secondary. So let me tell you what defines them. Primary lymphatic organs or tissues like the red bone marrow, the primary lymphatics is either where the lymphocytes are produced or where the lymphocytes mature. Because when the lymphocytes are produced, like all blood cells, they're made in red bone marrow. You guys remember that, right? All blood cells come from red bone marrow, including lymphocytes. So as it turns out, the lymphocytes are made in an, Im they're, they're, when they are produced, they're produced in an immature form, <clears throat> which means they do not have the capability yet to carry out an immune response. So they have to undergo further development. So in some cases, like for the T lymphocytes, they're produced in the red bone marrow. So red bone marrow is going to be considered a primary lymphatic. However, the T lymphocytes actually are released into circulating blood in the immature form. And they aren't ready to carry out an immune response yet. And those immature T cells are called pre T cells, pre. I'm going to show you that in a second. So that means the T cells have to go to a different organ where they then further develop and they become mature and are able to carry out an immune response. So when the lymphocytes are able to carry out an immune response, we say that they are immunocompetent. That means they're competent in carrying out their, their function, their immune response, immunocompetent. So a primary lymphatic is where the, the cells are either made and or where they mature. So in the case of T cells, they're made in red bone marrow, but then they're released into circulating blood as a pre-T cell and they migrate to the thymus gland. Now the thymus gland is found just anterior and superior to your heart in your thoracic cavity. So it's actually the thymus gland lies right on top of the superior vena cava and where the brachiocephalic veins join together. So up here in the top part of your thoracic cavity. Now the thymus gland is considered a primary lymphatic because that's where T cells mature. They finalize their development in the thymus gland. And we'll talk about the thymus in a minute. So these are the two primary organs, red bone marrow and the thymus gland. The secondary lymphatics in our body are the organs or the tissues where the immune responses will be carried out. So the immunocompetent cells will carry out immune responses in order to eradicate the pathogens from the body. So what types of organs are considered to be secondary lymphatic organs or where we carry out immune responses? Well, the lymph nodes, everybody knows those, heard of those. So we have lymph nodes stationed around different parts of the body. The tonsils around your oral cavity, some of them you just identified on a model for the digestive system, although the tonsils are not part of digestion, 
They were on that head model. And then the spleen. So we have to talk about all of these organs and look at what they look like. So that's where the immune responses will be carried out. Now let's talk about the cells a little bit and what type of immune responses we actually have in the body. And like I said, again, in lecture, you're gonna learn a little bit more detail on this. Here, we're just gonna look at what the name, the type of response we have and what cells carry it out. So ultimately we have two lymphocytes. We have B cells and T cells. You guys know that already, right? The B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes, like all other blood cells are made in red bone marrow, but the B lymphocytes also mature in the red bone marrow. So once the B lymphocytes are released into the circulating blood from red bone marrow, they are already ready to carry out their immune response. That means they're released in an immunocompetent form already. They're mature. Now, when a B cell is introduced to a pathogen that you, you came in contact with, like a virus or something, or you might have a bacterial infection, whatever the case may be, when the B cell is introduced to a pathogen, it becomes activated. So before the lymphocytes, the, all lymphocytes, B and T cells, have to be introduced to the pathogen first before they become activated. There's a whole physiological process, a signaling mechanism that goes on with that. Again, we don't have time to do that in here. You're gonna look at the, the process in lecture. But nonetheless, when they are introduced to their pathogen that they can fight off, in this case, they become, they become activated. So an activated B cell is called a plasma cell. Now, plasma cells do one thing and one thing only. Once the B cell develops into the plasma cell, they produce antibodies. Antibodies are secreted proteins. So the, the plasma cell is basically making these proteins and they're exocytosing or secreting these proteins out into our fluids. They flow through the plasma in your blood. They're also flowing through the lymph in the lymphatic system. So the B lymphocytes are the cells that produce antibodies in our immune system. T cells don't make antibodies, B cells do. But the B cell has to be activated first to a plasma cell before it makes the antibody. So since B cells are involved in being activated to plasma cells to make antibodies, and the antibodies are very specific for the antigens that they can bind to on the pathogens, which helps eradicate the pathogen from the body. Since the B cells do that, we say that B lymphocytes are involved in what we call antibody mediated immunity. It's referred to as AMI. So on the test, if you're asked which of the following cell types is involved in AMI, you would have to say B lymphocyte, or if, the, if in the answer it says plasma cell, I mean, a plasma cell is basically nothing more than an activated B lymphocyte. So B cells carry out antibody-mediated immunity. T cells help eradicate pathogens, although they do it differently. T cells, like I said, are produced in red bone marrow. They're released to the circulating blood in an immature form called a pre-T, a pre-T cell. These pre-T cells circulate to your thymus gland where they finalize their development. The thymus gland is a big testing ground for our T cells. They finalize their development there and they're also tested, just like you guys get tested to see how well you know the material. T cells have to be tested. They have to, our thymus gland has to make sure that your T cells, by the time they leave the thymus gland to get into circulation, that, that your T cells cannot be activated against your own cells. If a T cell, and for that matter, a B cell, can become activated against your own tissues in your body, you would develop an autoimmune disorder. Now, obviously that happens. 
because people develop autoimmunity disorders all the time. So the process is not 100% efficient, but it's a pretty good one. All right. Now, so the type of testing that these T cells undergo, the, the thymus gland makes sure the T cell can do two things. One, can the T cell tell the difference between what is you from what is not you? In other words, can the T cell recognize that it's trying to be activated against a bacteria relative to one of your own cells in your body? What is you from what is not you, right? So that is called self tolerance. Our T cells have to display self tolerance. In other words, it has to, the T cells have to know not to become activated against our own cells and tissues. So that's the type of testing that goes on. The other type of test is, is reactivity. We wanna make sure that the T cells can't react. If they recognize our own cells and they don't react to it, that's what we want. If they react against our own antigens, then the thymus, the thymus gland has to kill the T cell. So T cells that fail these two types of tests ultimately die in the thymus gland. And what is amazing is only about 3% of all of the T cells that get that develop and get tested in the thymus gland actually pass all of the tests and enter your circulation. The other 95 to 97% of them or so don't pass and they all have to be inactivated. Kind of crazy. Now, while the T cell, the pre T's are developing in the thymus gland, they will produce different types of receptors that are displayed in their membrane. Depending on what class of receptors the pre T cell begins to make, we can classify the T cell into different categories. So we have, there's hundreds of different receptors, by the way. It's beyond the scope of this course even to teach you all of the receptors. There's a whole class just on immunology, by the way, where you learn all of that. So when I was in grad school and took immunology, we learned all the different receptors, uh, over a hundred of them. So the two, really we're learning four receptors today. Two of them are on the T cells. The other two are on all the other cells in your body. So if a pre T cell develops what is called the CD8 receptor, it becomes what we call a CD8 cell. Now the CD8 cell takes on different names. We can call them a T8 cell or a cytotoxic killer T cell. So the CD8s are called cytotoxic killers when they're activated. The other T cells will display a CD4 receptor. And if they display a CD4 receptor, they're called CD4 cells or often we just say T4. So we can say a T8 cell or a T4 cell. Now T4 cells are called the helper T cells. The helper T cells are called helper T cells because they help in the activation of both antibody mediated immunity and in the activation of cell mediated immunity or what is called CMI. So the T4 cells are what we call our helper Ts. They actually are our immune response is shaped like a Y. We have the, the B cells with antibody mediated immunity. We have the T8 cells with CMI cell mediated immunity. And right in the middle is a, C4, a T4 cell, the helper T cell. Now HIV, the virus that causes AIDS attacks these cells right here. So the AIDS virus kills our helper T cells which renders the entire immune system non-functional. And that's why a person that is infected with AIDS in symptomatic disease, they have what is called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. That's what AIDS stands for. I'm sure you know that by now. 
is called acquired because you acquired the virus that then killed off your helper T cell, which now renders your AMI and your CMI inactive. You're immunodepressed. Your, your immune system is non-functional. So we suppress the immune response when our T4 cells can't work. Now the T8 cells eradicate pathogens by killing cells directly. And that's why this is what I like to call cell to cell combat. When a T8 cell is activated against a pathogen, say a bacteria, it turns into the cytotoxic killer T cell. The cytotoxic killer T cell then kills the bacteria directly or kills your own cell in your body that is infected with a virus. So if your cells become infected with a virus, like the COVID virus now, like the HIV, any virus, viruses infect our cells by injecting their genetic material to the inside of the cell. That changes the machinery on the inside of our own cell to become nothing more than a viral particle production factory. Basically, the viruses hijack your cell to make your cell produce more of the virus that infected it to begin with. That's how viruses work. So when our cells are infected with a virus, and if our T cell can become activated against the antigens, the viral antigens that are displayed at the surface of our own cell, your cytotoxic killer T cell is going to go kill your own cell. So it, it basically will block further production of the virus. For that reason, since a cell is killing a cell, that's called cell-mediated immunity. So on this physiology test, I need you to know that T8 cells are involved in CMI. The B cells are involved in AMI. So is everybody with me so far? Yeah. All right, I'll take the silence as a yes. Now, yes. very good. This uh, histology picture that I have here, these are basically like my other chapters of the slides that I used to physically use in the lab and I took pictures of them and I put them in my book. Um, it doesn't really matter what slide you look at. A thymus gland looks like a thymus gland is a thymus gland. It, it doesn't matter even if the coloration is a little different. A thymus gland, our thymus gland is a primary lymphatic organ. It is encapsulated, meaning it has collagen fibers, connective tissue surrounding the outside of it. So these little pink fibers up here are parts of the capsule. Now it's been teased apart a little bit. That's an artifact of fixing the slide. But nonetheless, that's the capsule. Now, if you look at this very closely, let's look at the low mag. You see all these little white lines running through the gland. Now, it looks like that would be open space, but it's not really. On a fixed slide, you might have some open space because of an artifact, but in the living organ, what that white, those white lines are, are called trabeculae, by the way. That's plural, or one would be called a tra trabecula. Trabeculae are invaginations of the collagen fibers from the capsule. And what that's important for is it partially lobulates the thymus gland into sections. So here's one thymic lobule right here. The thymic lobule has a middle part and an outer part. The middle part is this different colored part here. Now in my slide, this, it's a little bit lighter. The outer part is a little bit darker. So this outer part is called the cortex. The outer part of any organ, or in this case, a little lobule of the organ is always called the cortex. The middle part is called the medulla. Now, the way this works is this. When the pre-T cells are coming into the thymus gland, because there's little arteries in here. When they're coming into the thymus gland, they start in the cortex first. They develop, they will either make the CD8 receptors or the CD4 receptors, they become T8 or T4 cells. They are then tested. So they actually migrate through the cortex as they're tested by other cells that are in the cortex. As they migrate through, the most mature 
and tested T cells end up in the medulla. And all the ones that pass the test leave circulation in medullary veins. So there's veins that are draining blood from the thymus gland. We don't see them in here, but they can enter into lymphatics and some of them can get into the cardiovascular system. So they, they migrate away in the lymphatic system or they're killed or inactivated if they didn't pass the test. Now you're gonna learn that again, like I said in lecture. But what I'm trying to say here is you have the more immature cells are in the cortex, the more mature ones are towards the medulla. Now, when you look at a slide of the thymus, the coloration may be different. In some stains, the medulla is darker and the cortex is lighter. So don't get thrown off by that. I'm not sure what pictures they have. I haven't looked at all of them. But if you see a different colored circular structure here and then it's darker, and then you see, you'll always see these white lines like this. You know you're looking at the thymus gland because these are trabeculae. You know, so don't think, oh, that's a pancreas and stuff like that. The pancreas will never have these trabeculae in it. The reason why I say pancreas is students often say pancreas when they look at this. I don't know why. It doesn't look like a pancreas to me at all. But <clears throat> nonetheless, just to let you know, this is not a pancreas. You never see trabeculae in a pancreas. So that's the identifying character. Look for the trabecula. You might not even see the capsule too well. But look for the trabecula and look for the medulla and the cortex of that lobule right there. The lobule is in between the trabeculae, right? All right, now, the next organ is actually the largest of the lymphatic organs in our body, which is the spleen. Here you see the model that you looked at for the digestive system, that's the pancreas you learn, with the duct and the duodenum and all that, right? Um, over here, is the spleen. The spleen lies in the left lateral, uh, upper left quadrant of our uh, abdominal cavity, left lateral side of our stomach. The stomach actually inflects into the spleen over here, all right? Now, if we look at the spleen on a slide, we will notice that the spleen actually has two different types of tissue that make it up. And first of all, the spleen is a secondary lymphatic organ because here's where we would carry out some immune responses <clears throat> now the spleen is encapsulated there's a dense connective tissue capsule around it so if you look at this picture up here low mag that's the capsule at the top up there now inside the spleen if i enlarge a portion of it here's an enlarged magnification area this is a, a vein in the spleen over here. It's kind of collapsed down a little bit. But then they have that little bitty circle right there that I circle and put a line on. And here's one right here as well, if you can see my pointer. That little circle. Around those little circles is a darker purple area. That darker purple area around that little circle, that little circle is a little bitty artery called the central artery. So around the central artery, and you see it's a little bit more purple in this area, right? That darker purple area is loaded down with white blood cells. There's some scattered red blood cells in here as well, but we have a whole bunch of white blood cells and lymphocytes all, and macrophages all around those central arteries. And typically it's a cylindrical shape, but depending on how we slice through it, the cylinder is not a perfect circle. Like most of the white, what's called white pulp is at the bottom of its artery, but normally it would surround the whole artery. But here's why I'm telling you this. We have white pulp and we have red pulp. The red pulp is the majority of all of the tissue in the spleen and it's made up of predominantly red blood cells. There are scattered white blood cells in here as well, but they're more concentrated in white pulp. So red pulp, at least in this stain, is the lighter pink area that you see all over here. When you start seeing this darker purple, you know you're looking at white pulp. So we have these two different tissues called pulp in the spleen, red pulp and white pulp, all right? So that's what you're looking for when you're identifying the spleen. Are we looking at a central artery? Do we see you know, a darker purple area? And it might not be 
this exact coloration. But if you see a different coloration and it's around a little circle like that, you know you're looking at the spleen. Notice this does not look anything like this, right? There's no trabeculae diving down in here. So that's the spleen, the single largest mass of lymphatic tissue in our body. Oh, so uh, for the, the practical under down here, what I have for the, uh, the functions and whatnot, we have it, the, the white pulp. Uh, contains all, you know, a few red cells, but also these lymphocytes and macrophages. The macrophages are involved in phagocytizing bacteria, or we help get rid of old, dead, dying, or worn out red blood cells and platelets. That's one of the uh, major functions of the spleen. We also can store platelets in our spleen that can be released into circulation if we have a massive hemorrhage event. We can release platelets into circulation. Now, in the fetus, while the baby is growing in utero, the spleen also is involved in blood cell production. This function is not in the adult, except in very, very, very extreme anemic conditions. So in the adult, we rely on our red bone marrow to make all of our blood cells. But in the fetus, hemopoiesis can occur in the spleen. So that's why I put that as one of the functions. Now, let's talk about the lymph nodes for a minute. The lymph nodes are an encapsulated lymphatic organ. It is a secondary lymphatic organ because it's where we carry out immune responses. T cells and B cells become activated, help eradicate pathogens, right? That's what I mean by that. If we look at a lymph node in cross section, you see it right here. There's a whole bunch of these little circles everywhere. These little circles, so if I enlarge it, we can see it better. These little circles are called lymphatic nodules or lymphatic follicles. Both of those names are the same. Some books just still call it a nodule, but I think in our book, they call it a follicle. So I've ended up using the older terminology just to let you know they mean the same thing. So we have this circular structure called a lymphatic nodule or a lymphatic follicle. Notice the circle is darker around the perimeter and it has a lighter staining center. That lighter staining center is called the germinal center. So this is where we're activating a whole bunch of B cells in that germinal center against pathogens. And so the B cells begin to turn into plasma cells which produce antibodies for us. Now we do have T cells along the perimeter and through the rest of the parts of the lymph node. In a lymph node, we have what's called the outer cortex. There's also something called the inner cortex. You're not identifying that. I'm just letting you know. So the very outer perimeter is called the outer cortex. Just into that is called the inner cortex. But the very middle of the lymph node is called, lo and behold, the medulla. So we have a one-way flow of lymph through lymph nodes. I know it's not on this picture, but the lymphatic vessels that enter, and, and lymph nodes are shaped like a little kidney bean, by the way. I know this little part's not, but it's shaped like a kidney bean. So the, the, the outer curved part, which is called the convex part, you have many lymphatic, little bitty lymphatic vessels entering the lymph node. Lymph is flowing through the lymph vessel into the lymph node. So the lymph node is like a little filter. The lymph has a one-way flow. It comes in the back, and then you ultimately have two lymphatic vessels that leave where it curves in, the convex portion. And so the vessels that carry lymph towards the lymph node are called the afferent vessels. Afferent means towards and the vessels carrying lymph out of the lymph node away from it are called the efferent. The word efferent means away from. So as this lymph is flowing through the lymph node, if there's any pathogens in that fluid, those pathogens are flowing across all the lymphatic uh, follicles, nodules, flowing through all of these special little spaces called sinusoids where all of your lymphocytes are being housed. 
And as the fluid is passing them, they are becoming introduced to the pathogens and they become activated to fight off their pathogen. So we begin AMI, we can then activate T cells that lead the lymph node and travel through the body to carry out the cell mediated immunity, CMI. So T cells become activated. They can fight off infection in lymph nodes, but they can also flow through lymphatic vessels and go through our body and fight off infectious agents all around our body, right? The B cells can also flow through lymphatics in our, our blood, but some of them, when they're activated, they just stay put. They can stay put in the lymph node and just secrete their proteins out, the antibodies out. In that way, the antibodies just flow around our body and help inactivate pathogens. Antibodies don't kill the pathogens directly. They just allow our other white cells and, and T cells to kill off those pathogens, right? Now, where are the lymph nodes located? Well, if you remember the names of the part of the body, you have it down pat. The name of the part of the body for your armpit was called the axillary region. The name of your neck is the cervical region, so forth and so on. So we have lymph nodes in our neck. We just call them cervical lymph nodes. In your armpit, they're axillary lymph nodes. It's that simple. In your thoracic cavity, which I just put thoracic region. I simplified this. We would just call them thoracic lymph nodes. But we can call them very specific names depending on which particular vessels they are lying next to. But we're not doing that. Like I could say bronchomediastinal lymph node. We're, we're not going to do that. We're just going to call them thoracic. Same thing down here for abdominal region. Well, you know, in your abdominal region, you have all kinds of stuff in there. You have your organs in there. You have different the nine different regions of the abdominal cavity. So the abdominal lymph nodes, we can just say abdominal lymph nodes. If they are around the intestine, we could say intestinal lymph nodes. Around the membranes that organize the intestine, which are called mesenteries, I can call them mesenteric lymph nodes. If they're down in the iliac region, your hip, I can call them iliac lymph nodes, so forth and so on. So you're going to see some of these names, like uh, the groin region. I think they have a pointer on those. They might not have the iliac ones, but down in the groin, those are called inguinal because that's the inguinal region, right? So I think on that model, there's a pointer at inguinal lymph nodes. You'll see it. At any rate, that's how you, you name them, just by the part of the body. So that's not too terribly difficult. Now, on the, for the physiology test, I want us to know a little bit more about these lymphocytes. And we know everything so far except for two names. I just reiterate it in these little paragraphs. So I label this as cells of immunity. The cells of immunity are basically your T cells and your B cells. But we have two types of T cells. Remember, we have the T8s and we have the T4s. The TH were identified because of the CD8 receptor. The T4 was identified because of the CD4 receptor. So what do the CD8 and the CD4 receptors do anyway? And why are those receptors important out of the hundreds that are up there? They're all important, trust me. But these classify the groups. That's why I always teach those. Um, and in my lecture notes for the lecture class, we learn a few more of these receptors in my lecture notes, but not for lab. So what do the CD8 receptors on the T8 cells do anyway? Well, here's our new word, major histocompatibility proteins, MHCs. Remember I said in the thymus gland, the T cells are tested to determine if they can tell the difference between what is you from what, what is not you. And if they react against our own cells, we need to kill them. I just said that a minute ago. So what types of receptors do the CD8 proteins and the CD4 receptors bind to on our cells? 
Well, they're called major histocompatibility proteins. These are proteins that are what are referred to as self-recognition proteins. In other words, those are some of the proteins that are displayed at the surface of all of the cells in our body except for mature red blood cells. Don't have them. All of the other cells in our body display one of two major types of MHCs. The MHCs are a group of proteins that allow your immune system to know the difference between what is you from what is not you. And when I teach this in general biology, because I introduce it there, I call these our cellular fingerprints. Because everybody knows everybody has different fingerprints, right? So my fingerprint, my cellular fingerprints are different from your cellular fingerprints, different from everybody's cellular fingerprints. And that's why if you put somebody else's heart in your body, a heart transplant, right? That patient will forever have to take immunosuppressive medication because their T cells and B cells are going to recognize the other person's heart as being foreign because the MHCs are different. Now they do a tissue typing and they try to type it the best they can to, dis to diminish those transplantation reactions. You know, but this is how this is how this happens. Our lymphocyte T lymphocytes have to be able to recognize the MHCs as being your own or a protein being different. So as it turns out, the CD8 receptor on the T8 cell always binds to the MHC1. Now, MHC1s are found on every single cell in your body except for red blood cells and cells referred to as antigen-presenting cells. Antigen-presenting cells include, or what we call APCs, antigen-presenting cells are called, or include macrophages, cells called dendritic cells, which are found in different places of our body, including the thymus gland, and B lymphocytes directly. So B lymphocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells have a different type of MHC. They contain MHC2 receptors. And T4 cells, which contain CD4 receptors, their CD4 receptor has the job of binding to the MHC2s, which are only found on antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells, again, are B cells. That's another function of a B cell. They can present antigens to the T cells. Macrophages and dendritic cells. These cells have the ability to process foreign antigens. For instance, give you an easy example. If you cut yourself and you become infected with a bacteria, macrophages flood that area and they start phagocytizing the bacteria to help eradicate the bacteria. Everybody kind of knows that already. So not only are the macrophages helping to kill the bacteria, but once the macrophage phagocytizes the bacteria in the special vesicle that it's, it's basically phagocytized into, which I'm not going back over, the bacteria is broken down, killed and broken down into little pieces. Some of those little bitty pieces are attached to an MHC2 protein that then is inserted 
in the surface of the B cell or the macrophage or the dendritic cell, the cells that phagocytize the bacteria to begin with. A little bitty piece of the bacteria attaches to the MHC2 and then is inserted in the surface of these cells. So now these cells are basically coated around the outside of themselves with pieces of what the pathogen looks like. And the T4 cells have a CD4 receptor that anchors to the MHC2 so that the T4 cell binds to the macrophage and then is introduced to that piece of that bacteria. Hey, can you see this little piece of the bacteria or not? And for that matter, can you be activated against it? And if you are activated against it, you then activate the T4 cell, which then helps activate the T8 cell to carry out cell-mediated immunity. So that's a part of how that immune response works. So the T8 cells have CD8s that bind to MAC1s that helps carry out CMI. T4 cells have CD4 receptors that bind to MHC2s that actually help carry out both CMI and AMI. And that's why they're called helper T cells. They help activate CMI and they help activate AMI. Now the B cells, like I said before, they are the cells that are activated, the plasma cells, when they're introduced to, back, uh, to the pathogens. And when they're activated they, into plasma cells, they produce antibodies. So they carry out antibody-mediated immunity. Now, the last thing that we have to talk about are the tonsils. Now, again, you'll probably have to identify those tonsils on that little head model. So to review that, you're probably going to have to go back and look at that little digestive system model because I didn't put the model in there twice, I don't think. So the only thing, you're not going to be identifying the teeth and the tongue and the nasopharynx and the trachea and all of that like you did on this last test. On the third practical, the, the only things that you would really identify on that head model are your tonsils. So where are the tonsils located? Well, you have that big pharyngeal tonsil at the back of the nasopharynx. You also have your palatine tonsil, which are at the back of the oropharynx. Those are the paired tonsils that you see when you open your mouth and look in the mirror if you still have your tonsils. If you had yours taken out, you won't see them. And then you have a pair, typically two, little bitty tonsillar areas at the base or of our tongue. Now, on the practical, that a pointer was pointing to the palatine tonsil, and everybody kept putting the lingual tonsil. I don't know why. But the lingual tonsil is easy. It's attached to the tongue. So if you have a pointer on a little mass of, of tonsil right there, and it's not actually off the back of the tongue, it's not the lingual tonsil, all right? All right, so let's talk about the tonsils a little bit, and then I'll take your questions because we're pretty much finished with the physiology here. First of all, the tonsils are a partially encapsulated lymphatic. Tonsils, that means that they have a, a capsule on the backside, but their apical side that faces the oral cavity does not have a connective tissue capsule around it, only the backside of it where it's embedding into the epithelium of your pharynx, your throat. Um, the tonsils are a secondary lymphatic organ. We carry out lymph, uh, immune responses there. Notice in this picture, low magnification, you see these little circular structures everywhere again. Those are lymphatic nodules or follicles. You still have that darker perimeter with the lighter standing center, which is the germinal center. So, how are you gonna tell the difference between a tonsil and a lymph node if they all have these little circles everywhere, right? Well, look at the circles for the tonsil. The tonsil tissue, the tonsillar tissue 
is loaded down with the lymphatic nodules all through the entire tonsil, right? Now, let me go back to the lymph node real quick. Look at the lymph node. The lymphatic nodules on a lymph node are confined to the cortex. Now here you see the majority of them in what's called the outer cortex. But if you look closely, you get some scattered little nodules that go in a little bit. That would be considered the inner cortex because in the lymph node, you have an outer and an inner cortex before you get to the very middle, which is called the medulla. And depending on where this section was through that particular lymph node, you might have the little tip of a lymph node where you have hardly any medulla in it. But if we were right down the center of a lymph node, the medulla area, the medullary area would be a little bit bigger than just this little area in the middle. But the identifying character, these lymphatic nodules are all confined to the perimeter like this. In a tonsil, they're scattered all throughout it. So we still have our B cells being activated in here. Your tonsils have these little spaces where fluid and sometimes food particles can get embedded in there. That's why you got to brush your teeth good. You got to gargle. You got to do all kinds of stuff, clean everything out. And this is called a tonsillar crypt. Now, the importance of that is that these lymphatic nodules are very close to the surface that gets exposed to everything that we're, we're swallowing, that drink and food, everything we're consuming. So if there's any pathogens in those food items that we are consuming, it is introduced to our T cells and our B cells that run through the tonsil. They become activated. They then can carry out an immune response to fight off that infectious agent, AMI and CMI. Now, the tonsils form a protective lymphoid ring around your oral cavity. And I, I mean, around your pharynx. The pharynx, which is considered your throat, has three parts to it. You have your nasopharynx at the back of the nasal cavity. You have your oropharynx at the back of your mouth. Now, you also have the laryngopharynx, but we don't have any tonsils down there. So at the very back of the nasopharynx and the back of the oropharynx, you would find tonsils. They are either the pharyngeal tonsil, which is called the adenoid. Everybody knows that common name. You also have your palatine tonsils, which are paired at the back of the oral pharynx, basically at the back of your mouth. And then you have a pair of small pair of lingual tonsils at the base of the tongue. And that's it. It forms a ring around your, a protective ring around your pharynx so that we're, when we swallow food and drink, we're introducing any pathogens we have to our immune system cells in those tonsils. Now I also have down here, which they may have, I don't know if they have a picture of it, but this is a lymphatic vessel. Lymphatic vessels resemble small veins, by the way, because they're thin walled they are lined by an endothelium, just like all the other blood vessels are. Lymphatic vessels are lined by an endothelium, and lymphatic vessels have valves in it. That's what this is that you're looking at here. So when lymph is flowing through a lymphatic vessel, the lymph is only going to flow in one direction. It can't backflow because that valve is going to shut and pre prevent a backflow of lymph. So it only flows in one direction. All right, so that's it, really, for the physiology here. So it's a fairly short chapter with that. Um, today, you should work on your lymphatic pre- and post-lab assignments. Um, and look at those quizlets in there. There's only a couple of models anyway that you're really learning. So this is going to be one of the shorter chapters on this third block testing unit. Mr. Russell. Go ahead. Was there something in the lab manual that you wanted us to look oh, at? Oh, thank you so much for I that. was just about to ask the same question. <laughs> yes, let's go back real quick. Sorry. There is one section okay. in the Engage manual that I need to show you. So let's see that real quick. It deals with the antibodies. I don't have 
the list of the antibodies in my chapter. So since it's in this chapter, I show everybody in here. So let's go look at exercise seven, the lymphatic system. And you can, I want you to read through the chapter. It basically has everything we just talked about. It might have a couple other things in there, or I might, I definitely covered stuff that's not in here. That's why I want you to definitely learn my cells because I don't think they talk about all the cells in here. I want you to learn those cells, right? So if we look through here, there's a chart right here. There's five classes of antibodies. I want you to know, and, and so you see they're in order for the concentration in our body. They're all called IG something. The first IG stands for immunoglobulin. So these antibodies are globular proteins. They're not filaments. They're kind of globular. They do have particular areas on them, but you know we kind of looked at that a little bit. There's a sticky end where the antibody will, will bind to its antigen. That's really what we call the variable region, but you're not learning all the parts of the antibody in here. You're gonna look at that in the lecture though, but I want you to know the name IgG, IgA, IgM, so forth and so on. You don't have to memorize the percentage of them, but you should know them in the order in which they're concentrated in the body. So I'm not gonna say uh, true or false, IgAs are around 10 to 15% of all the antibodies. I won't do that. I will say something like, True or false, IgGs are the most concentrated of the antibodies uh, in the fluids of our body. They're also the uh, antibodies that are involved with the transfusion reactions for blood groups. So remember we talked about a, type A, B, AB, and O blood? I said if you have anti-A antibodies, you don't want any A blood in your body. If you have anti-B antibodies, you don't want any B blood in your body. Well, the anti-A the anti-B and the anti-RH antibodies are IgG antibodies. IgA is found in secretions at our body. It's found in breast milk for the baby. It's okay. secreted in sweat. It's in your tears and your saliva, secretions in your gastrointestinal tract. These antibodies, besides being the, the baby drinking the milk, these antibodies basically coat the membranes in the body that are wet. So uh, over the surface of your eye, tears are constantly coating the surface of your eye. Perspiration, saliva in your, in your mouth. Our, this protects us. It gives some protection against bacteria and viruses on those mucus and wet membranes everywhere, right? Um, IgMs are found in the lymph and they're found in other fluids in the body. These are, um, these are the antibodies also in the ABO blood typing system that is ultimately going to cause agglutination. So they are actually the structures on the plasma membrane that will cause the lysis of the cell when the anti-A antibodies and the anti-B antibodies are there the IgMs. IgDs are found on B lymphocytes. They are actually the type of the type of receptor that the B cells can be activated with. So when I said B cells have to be activated, this is a type of receptor that's at their surface that helps them become activated the plasma cells. IgEs are the ones that you don't like if you have an, if you're allergic to something. These are involved in what we call uh, super or heightened inflammatory responses, allergy attacks. They also help protect you against parasitic worm infections because they're found on uh, basophils, they're found on eosinophils. If on basophils, these IgEs are what makes the basophils hypersensitive to an allergen. So if you say you're allergic to pollen 
and you get really sick with the allergy symptoms. It's because the basophils have a whole bunch of IgEs that were activated on them and caused the basophils to dump out too much histamine, which brought about a, main, a major inflammatory response. And so you're sneezing, you have a runny nose, your itchy eyes and all of that. Some allergic reactions could be life-threatening, can be very, very, very severe. Like when someone is allergic to a bee sting and can die unless they have the EpiPen. So allergic reactions can be fairly mild or very serious. It depends on the person and what they're allergic to and how sensitized their inflammatory cells are to that allergen. And it deals with the IgEs, all right? So IgEs are gonna help protect you against parasitic worm infections, but they also bring about our allergic reactions. So the only thing I really want you to look at out of the Engage chapter is this table and you're good to go. All right, so.